Hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel, I see books. I'm Camilla. Today I'm wrapping up my books from February. And if you follow this for just a little bit, you might know that I have a goal this year in 2024 to read less. So fewer books and better books. <laughs> so books that I enjoy more and books that I try not to hurry through. And yeah, I'm, I'm trying to kind of pace myself and relax. Well, in February, that didn't really work out. <laughs> so let's get through them. There were six books on my February TBR, including Anna Karenina, which I did say I wasn't going to finish it, to be fair, and I haven't. And we're one week into March and I still haven't. Almost there, almost there. Um, I also did read through Family Lore by Elizabeth Acevedo, uh, but did not finish it. I finished it actually just a few days ago, so it will be wrapped up in my March. Although I read the bulk of it in February. But I did read North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. Uh, this was a reread for me as well. As you may know, in January I reread some books and it kind of was really good to revisit books that I really enjoyed. And so in... I think I plan on doing North and South, but and I had a hold and it took a while to get to me. So I actually listened to it uh, on audio in February and I still love it so much. <laughs> I don't have a lot to review about this because it's a reread, but uh, it's still my favorite Victorian novel. It deals with class and with industrialization and with, there's a love story and there's like obviously family relationship and there's some things about war and about duty and just there's lots and I love it. No notes. <laughs> the other three books from my January TBR I didn't read. I started two of them, but I haven't finished them. I'm really only in the start of both of them. And then I don't know how much of them I'm going to read in March and April because I'll be focusing primarily on the Women's Prize for Fiction long list. So let's ignore those for now. I will finish them when I finish them. <laughs> Hopefully in 2024. Let's see. In total in February I read eight books uh, including North and South so I will give you wee reviews about these seven other books that I read. I also didn't have three books. Three books that I didn't think were bad books but when I started them I realized you know what I don't want to do this and then I stopped myself and then I moved on to something else. <laughs> so I'm pleased with myself that I'm learning to DNF. In the past I think I think I always DNF'd, but sometimes for me, like literally just trying one chapter and then moving on didn't feel like a DNF. It was just more of a like, no, I don't think I have interest for this. It's not even really starting a book, you know, you don't invest that much time into them. And also, I don't believe in reviewing books you DNF because you just don't know that book. So you can't actually have a review. So we'll just ignore these and not talk about them. <laughs> But the other seven books that I read, I enjoyed, enjoyed is the wrong word, because there's two books that were difficult to read, but I thought they were good books, but they were difficult to read. Let's keep them for the end. So, you know, skip ahead if you want to know what the difficult reads of February were. But let's start with the book that I read to start the month, and I said I read it in one sitting. So that's why also I read lots of books, because they were a lot shorter books. So it is Un thé dans la tundra, a tea in the tundra by Josephine Bacon, who is an Innu writer from uh, the ter territory that is now called Quebec in Canada. I had recommended this because it was on my TBR for my like, kind of reading around Quebec because of I think my mom saw it and then she sent me this at Christmas and so I read it and it is really really good. And what's really cool is that I am actually participating in the Reading Around Canada Challenge for um, 2024, which is hosted uh, by the lovely Jolene from Bookworm Adventure Girl. And this counted as like three of the prompts. So I was really pleased with myself because technically this was originally written in Inu Aimun and translated into French. There's also a translation in English if you're interested. I thought it was really, really beautiful poetry, very kind of simple about the earth, about the tundra really, and about the relationship that people have uh, to each other in the tundra, but also to the actual natural environment. And yeah, I just thought it was really, really uh, quietly beautiful. 
Then I read another very short book and I read it in one day as well. It's called Fatty Legs, A True Story. So this is actually nonfiction. This was written by Christy Jordan Fenton uh, in collaboration with her, I think it's her mother-in-law, um, Uleman Pokiak Fenton, uh, who the story is about. So basically it's her story of when she was a young child. She, so she's from the Northwest Territories in Canada, like from an island in basically the Arctic. And she wanted because she didn't really know the reality of it. She wanted to go to school in a residential school. So it's her story of standing up for herself and standing up to bullies. There are multiple bits to this story about Uleman. Um, also, I think her kind of Christian name was Margaret, but she's trying to reclaim uh, her uh, Inu name, which is uh, Uleman. And yeah, I thought it was really beautiful. It is a book for children. So it felt simplistic at times and also sometimes I was like, it seemed to glaze over the horror of a residential school, but I just don't know if because it's she went to a residential school that wasn't as horrifying as the other ones. You know, like I, I don't know or just focus on like one aspect, which was her standing up. And even though there is some trauma in the story, I thought it was beautiful. And I found it because obviously I was looking for writers and books by authors from the Northwest Territories as I'm reading across Canada. So again, it's kind of fulfilling uh, a different spot. So I have Quebec and then I have Northwest Territories. So yeah, a good one. Then I finally read The Secrets of Artful Hall by Katie Lumsden of the lovely books and things on booktube. And so again, short story before we get into it, I got the art last year. But my copy on my net it was not really net like arc like slash Kindle. There were issues with it, and I was really struggling to read it. I was going to go to Katie's uh, book launch because she invited me, which was very lovely, and I wasn't able to make it. So I was like, oh, I guess I don't have to rush to reading it now because I wasn't going. And then a lot of time passed, and it just, yeah. But then December, January came. I know it's almost a whole year, but still. December, January came and literally it was on so many people's best books of 2023 and a little, a little part of me was like, are people just being gushing because we know her, because she's a member of our community, because maybe they've met her and, you know, gone to her book launch and stuff like that. And so I was just like, okay, you know, it's like reading a book by a friend. You're just like, I'm going to go in. I know I have to like it. <laughs> But I also want to be honest and well, I didn't have to be worried because it was an excellent book. I ended up purchasing the audiobook because also I watched the Q&A that she did with Charlie and Charlie and I loved it. She talked about, you know, when the audiobook was being recorded and how it was really good. And I was like, okay, I'll give that a try instead. So I purchased it through Zigzag and I listened to it. And I really enjoyed it. I thought she got so many, like the the atmosphere of like Victorian novels of like these creepy houses, estates, you know, and the mysteries that are behind them. It reminded me of Jane Eyre, of Tenants of Wafa Hall, uh, also actually of um, Daphne du Maurier, actually a little bit, the vibe. And yeah, I just really, really liked it. It was beautifully done and I love that there was like a modern tone to it and I think a lot of, I personally really enjoy it. Obviously I think it's really nice when writers of historical fiction today add these modern influences and tones to their very historical novel and I, I don't feel that that gives it an achronistic, achronistic? Okay, I'm sorry, I think that that's the word. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> um, you know, tendency to this book. But anyway, I really liked it. By the end as well, there was a twist. It made me, like, I feel like it was a good book. And I got to the end and there were twists and there was like how it ended. I was like, boom, it like pushed it even higher for me because I thought I, I just loved it. Um, so yeah, if you like historical fiction, you will like this. Like, I definitely give it a try. I definitely recommend it. And that's coming from someone who was like, oh, like, I hope it's good because I don't want to be the person who's just like, you know, <laughs> I need to put a damper on things. But no, I was totally 
word for nothing basically because this was an excellent debut by Katie and I'm looking forward to her second novel already. I also listened to the audiobook for The Burnout by Sophie Kinsella. This was my first Kinsella. I feel like she's a like giant of women's fiction, <laughs> like this generic women's fiction. And the audiobook just came on my library app and I was looking for something light and breezy. Obviously something called The Burnout maybe isn't, but it ended up being very much about like well-being and also the appearances of well-being, you know, like, oh yeah, I'm going to drink my kale smoothie and stuff like that. But what it is that people are really looking for and they're looking for like a well, like a work-life balance or stuff like that. And there's a romance in it, which I thought was sweet. There's a little bit enemies to lovers situation. Um, so yeah, like a good average like romance. And I thought it was well done. It reminded me a, bit, a little bit of Beth O'Leary. But yeah, it was it was quite good. So I finished a month uh, listening to your book Much Ado About Nada by Uzma uh, Jaludin. I really, really loved Aisha at last that I read last year during Jane Austen July and I saw this audiobook and I thought we'd give it a try and I really enjoy her voice and her description of her community um, in Canada so yeah I really enjoyed it. It is technically influenced by persuasion but to me it wasn't enough persuasion because I love persuasion but the same that I think and I saw in the reviews, a lot of people said that it wasn't bogged down in the details. It wasn't like dragged down by being a retelling of persuasion, which actually I can see now and I can really appreciate because she really made this whole, um, the relationship very much their own. Like they weren't really based on uh, the persuasion kind of type um, of, of storytelling of, you know, like the girl was influenced to not end up marrying the boy and then later on she re-meets him again and they kind of bond again it's a little bit that in broad terms but like there are so much more details in terms of like why she decided to not be with him at that time because of personal reason like finding that out and growing but also there's a lot of like about business and she's a woman in stem and there's like a lot about her being very business driven and losing that drive and trying to look out for herself while also being a pillar in her family and you know her traditional parents and like where she can stand within all of that uh, while also having a bit of the romance. I feel like some of the stuff between her and her partner weren't addressed totally properly. Um, like there was some manipulation sometimes on both sides and some I don't know some harder things to reconcile but also as a general rule, I thought it was a very good book and I would definitely read more by uh, Uzma Jaludin. And also she counts as one of my writers from Canada. So that's great, love it. <laughs> then I finished Blessings by Chukwe Buka Ibe. And this is a book that I got through NetGalley. So actually I got an email, <sighs> it's a long story that I'm gonna try to say it quickly, but I basically got an email uh, from Penguin about the fact that they'd seen that I'd given some really good reviews to uh, Kayla Bezumina's novels and they were like oh here try this debut novel called Blessings and I was like mm, okay <laughs> like literally if you're gonna compare anything to me to like Kayla Bezuma and Nelson I'll be like cool I'm in but I feel like I was misled so I think that I went to this book not understanding what it was really about and that kind of tainted my experience of it. So, well, I think it was a good book generally. I don't think it was for me. And it was very traumatic. So maybe if you're looking for trauma, go ahead. Um, the experience was quite miserable. Because very early on, um, you realize that the boy that we're following, Obiefuna, is queer. And his he's growing up in a town, uh, Port Harcourt, in... Nigeria and his father witnesses something between him and his apprentice and he's sent away to seminary school like immediately and the minute he arrives there it's trauma and violence and torture like almost non-stop and I was really heavy I I was if it hadn't been a Ned Galley arc I would have been like nope I'm not reading this 
I don't want to put myself through that. I don't want to read this. This isn't really for me. But I'm trying to finish Ned Galliard so I can actually review them. So here we are. We follow his life basically from birth to childhood into young adulthood. And I didn't think the pacing was very good in this book. So that's sometimes issues with debut novels. And I also thought it was really bizarre because sometimes we got chapters with the point of view of his mother. I really enjoyed those, but also I was like, cool, why? We see sort of pol the political context of Nigeria as well uh, as they are, I want to say criminalizing um, like homosexual relationship and marriage, uh, but I'm, I might be saying this wrong, apologies. It might be that they just were like, this won't be legal rather than criminalized, but I don't remember, but like it just, the trauma continues until the end, you know, like there's never like anything nice that comes out of this book. So a difficult one to review because I feel like I'm not the audience for this and I didn't really appreciate it as much and I don't think it has as much vulnerability and nuance as Caleb Azumi Nelson has portrayed in his books. But if you're looking for a slightly traumatic narrative about a queer boy growing up in Nigeria, you could try this one because I think that that's kind of the main gist of this book. Um, along with the relationship that he has with his mother, which I thought was really nice, but I didn't feel was explored enough. And yeah, I would have probably taken the whole book of that, but it wasn't really what it was. All right, we've turned the light on. Apologies, it, it's getting darker than I realized. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we're ending with the last book, which was the kind of harder book to read. And this was a book from the Women's Prize for Nonfiction long list. And it's one of the audiobooks that I found and I thought I would give it a try. It is Some People Need Killing, A Memoir of Murder in My Country by Patricia Evangelista. This is a memoir that read not memoir, I mean it's sort of a memoir but it's also very journalistic because Evangelista is a journalist and she's from the Philippines and she talks about the regime of Duterte. So background on what I know about the Philippines. Not very much. I have some good friends from there um, and also <laughs> The main thing I know about Duterte is from Superstore. So that would tell you a lot. I didn't realize that he, I thought he was a dictator, but he seemed to have been voted in. And then he started like a proper war on drugs that became a bit of a, a war of terror and of people taking it in their own hands. And it becomes basically chaos like it's just clearly it was people were left to their own devices in terms of dealing with crime potential crime what they think was drug abuse or simple drug taking whatever it was it was very gruesome there's a lot of violence obviously because of the sort of memoir that we're talking about here evangelista is very good at having a bit of a distance while also making us feel like everything, like the horror of what's happened. But it does feel sometimes that distance is a bit cold and I feel that like that's the journalistic kind of tone in there. And to me, I thought it was very educational. Like it's great to be able to find out everything that we find in this book. And we also learn about basically the background of how we even got in and what he was doing before and the different people that were in charge of different things, you know, police themselves or in the government and stuff like that. And she has lots of contacts, which was really interesting when she was talking about how she was maintaining those contacts and also the distance she had to keep to one, stay alive and to be allowed to still write and, and inquire about all of those things and investigate. So I thought that that was really fascinating. I had issues with not pacing, but her timeline. Sometimes I was really confused where we're at, what she's talking about. And I think obviously that's sometimes the problem with listening to audio. But I also think sometimes she went on a timeline and in her timeline she would zoom in. Like it was like very political context timeline and she would zoom in on personal stories. And so that brought like the personal to like the kind of bigger picture which was a great way to kind of make us understand and care about all of those horrifying things that are happening and like put not 
faces because obviously we can't see anything but you know like put names and real people to these stories but then she would zoom back out and I did I wouldn't know where we were and I wouldn't know what she's talking about um so I did think that that was really confusing I still think it's a must read I think people have to know about what's happened and like why and why that's come from and all that but also yeah it's one not to not to approach or to take on if that's maybe something you don't want to experience or read about because it's very much like trigger warnings for like everything basically um because it's very yeah it's very traumatizing uh, stuff to read about generally my month was really good except for blessings which i only finished because it was an, an arc and also i was misled i believe except for that one i feel like every other book like i'm really glad that i read and i think i'm continuing my enjoying my books more and picking up books that i actually do want to read so yeah so i think it's good it's well it's going well even though i did read more books than i should have <laughs> so obviously eight instead of like five or six but i still think it's all right it's all right and i will maybe you know take a bit of a chill after the woman's prize so that my reading goes down but yes i'm obviously already reading very much in march and i will probably be going through a lot of books for the women's prize for fiction but <laughs> i'm yeah i think this is like the busy usually time of the year and then i will relax a bit but i will be back with more reviews soon you'll see more reactions so come back for those let me know if you read any of the books that i've mentioned what you thought about them you know if you agree with me what was your favorite book of february share that with me as well and as always, thank you so much for watching and hasty back. Bye.